Uh, quick, re quick recovery. Huh? I, was, I got out uh, at the end of August, but um, okay. um, three weeks ago, my um, cardiologist said I could drive. All right. And, uh, well, my, 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 my girlfriend lives in Burlington. That's why I'm here. Oh, okay. Okay. But um, anyway, long story. Yeah, I know a I'm guy who was a former mayor of Burlington, Vermont. Yeah, I know. Um, that guy, yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> I've been here before, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. I um, wore my birdie shirt to come up here. <laughs> so we are live um, at Community Church. That's me in a lonely auditorium. Uh, how's everybody? My name is Dean. I am you called. You start the recording, didn't you? Yes, I did start recording. We are live on YouTube. I am called the interim administrator uh, uh, of Community Church, and uh, as such, host of these crazy Zoom meetings, which we had a little scare just a minute ago. Thank you to Charlie Welch, our our technical engineer. Uh, we were able to play to you instead of to an empty Zoom meeting, uh, which is a miraculous thing. Um, I think that what I like most about what I do here is that I'm um, a music director and guitar player, and I get to pick and hire and, and invite and host music in this beautiful, though empty room. Um, and, one of the two or three for which we drop everything and host whenever it is, whatever time, whatever day, uh, is Roy Zimmerman. And sometimes he doesn't give me much warning, uh, but uh, we just love certain touring performers. And Roy embodies, I think, what we do and love here, which is uh, music and art for the sake of peace and justice and change. And Roy has been d doing some amazing work in this time of, of isolation, producing incredible uh, YouTubes that have gotten gazillions of views. If you haven't seen this, go to Roy Zimmerman, vote him away and you'll see the 10 or 11 million views that it's gotten. And it's just a, a wonderful, brilliant, funny, clever thing. And I, I, I also mention Roy's well, wife, Melanie Har Harvey, and, um, and companion in songwriting, who uh, they tour out here and, and all over the place, all over the country. And if, if they weren't in one place by, by no choice of their own, they'd be around the country, especially in this pre-election time uh, touring. So that's enough. I am just so, so glad to welcome Roy to open our program today at Community Church of Boston. And, and, and then we'll hear some more from him later on in the program. Welcome, Roy. Thank you, Dean. I'm so glad to be here. It's just, you know, the, I'm, I'm really happy for the opportunity Zoom provides, you know, for me to get these songs out to people like like I used to when I toured all over the place and met all kinds of people. I'll tell you, all kinds of people. Um, um, it's a big, big world full of all kinds of people, but there's one thing we can all agree on. Um, and when I find out what it is, I'll let you know. Some people eat chicken with their fingers. Some people use a fork and a knife. Some people are sucking on the silver spoon. Never ate a chicken in their life. Some people look better in the daytime. Some look better at night. But everybody loves, everybody hurts. Everybody has a touch of belch smirts. Everybody laughs, everybody sneezes. Everybody fries and everybody freezes. Everybody, everybody. 
Everybody is everybody else. Some people want to guarantee your freedom. Some people want to take one away. Some say we the people, that's the government. And some say the government day. Some people are walking on the left wing. Some are sliding off the right. But everybody loves, everybody hurts. Everybody has a touch of Belchmerz. Everybody laughs, everybody sneezes. Everybody cries and everybody freezes. Everybody, everybody, everybody is everybody else and everybody everywhere lesser and greater has a common denominator some people look up and see the ceiling some people look up and see god some people look forward to a paradise some are looking forward to the sod a lot of people looking for enlightenment some are just trying to find the light. But everybody loves, everybody hurts. Everybody has a touch of Belchmerz. Everybody laughs, everybody sneezes. Everybody cries and everybody freezes. And everybody sleeps, everybody breathes. Everybody starts with no teeth and teeth. Everybody eats, everybody cries and identifies with the good guy. Everybody's bad. Everybody's good, everybody wants to be understood. Everybody falls, everybody rises, everybody on some level realizes that everybody, everybody, everybody is everybody else. Everybody, absolutely everybody is everybody else. <laughs> Thank you, Roy. And welcome, everybody who's coming on. Welcome to Community Church of Boston. We are physically located in a, in a funky old office building, uh, commercial building in Copley Square, but we are virtually located everywhere. Roy comes in from California. Stephen comes in from uh, right here in Boston. And all of you coming in from Maine and Maryland and a couple other places, Vermont. Um, so welcome. And uh, I want to start out on our 100th anniversary at Community Church, which the, the festivities were a little bit uh, truncated by a, a certain virus. But um, we're, still, we're still here and we're, we're uh, doing it up as best we can. These are words from um, our founder, whose name was Clarence Skinner. Universalist minister and uh, theologian, dean of uh, Tufts School of Theology. And uh, this is some of the intent that is described in, in the, the beginnings of, of this church uh, 100 years ago, 1920. Out of the world's wide ways we come to this, our house of fellowship and aspiration. Here may the evils which beset us be banished by the power of justice. The fears that haunt us be overcome by fresh insight. The doubts that drive us be dissolved into finer faith. Here, each in our own way, yet together, let us for a brief time look into the mysteries of life's beginning, the source out of which the endless eons roll and countless lives emerge. And with renewed hope, search through this maddening maze of things to find again life's aims and meaning, and above all, its glory. Clarence Skinner from 1920. Another thing we like to do at the beginning is light a candle. I'm gonna, light, I'm gonna talk about two things during this lighting, actually three. Um, get them out of the way. Uh, if I can figure out, ah, burn down the building, no. or my beard. First thing I want to show you, if I can share the screen, is um, a project of Louis Randa, which is a memorial to 
all of the, all of the people who have been lost in the pandemic. And as Lewis is, is um, want to do, it's set in, in bronze and, and uh, granite. It was displayed at the uh, Swedenborgian church over uh, by Sanders Theater in Harvard Square. But um, can you all see that? This is, this is a tribute and a memory to all the people that we have lost in this pandemic. Here's a picture of the entire stone that uh, um, is, weighs several tons and will be touring around uh, the city and then going out to the Peace Abbey. Louis Randa was the director of the Peace Abbey when it was a physical place and now it's, it's a, um, a place that is in our imagination and in our hearts and he still does amazing projects. That's um, Louis Randa's tribute to, uh, to everybody who has been lost. Too many souls, too many lives. The second tribute I'd like to pay is a very personal one. It is to my uncle who passed away last night. His name was John Stamm. Um, as many of you know, my parents um, were missionaries in Costa Rica Evangelical missionaries, uh, they um, worked in, in agriculture and in child welfare, um, uh, very kind of a conservative cloth. But my uncle and aunt also went to Costa Rica in the early 50s as missionaries, and they were both also evangelical, but breaking the mold of evangelical. They were both very academic um, my uncle was a theologian and, and a scholar uh, of the New Testament, and, um, and he um, spent his first um, couple years on the mission field on the border of Costa Rica with Nicaragua, um, hearing the stories of Nicaraguans uh, uh, driven out of um, Somoza's uh, dictatorship. And he became a radical, he called himself a radical evangelical, which is strange. You don't think to associate those two words. But um, uh, years passed and the 80s came along and he and his wife, my Aunt Doris, uh, went and moved to Nicaragua and lived there. And he taught in a seminary there. Um, I just pay this tribute to a, a righteous man who, who taught me to think out of the box of my own parents' um, uh, kind of uh, evangelical uh, orthodoxy. And I will remember him sweetly uh, for my visits to uh, John and Doris in, in Nicaragua and, and in Costa Rica where they moved back to in, in the late 80s. Juan Estam was his name, or John, John Stam. Juan Estam Presente is what I say. I also want to share an incredible community church joy. In fact, two of them. Um, we have 10 members behind bars, but it just, it just moved to eight because two of them were released. Arnie King was released about um, two weeks ago, and just the day before yesterday, Tommy Rosa. And here's two very different stories, but both, uh, it's just a wonderful moment right now to celebrate. Arne King committed a, uh, a, a crime when he was a teenager um, in, in a botched uh, a drug deal. Everybody was high, and he spent 48 years in jail. And um, his, uh, he, is, he is free. We have um, advocated for Arne's uh, release to a, a bunch of different governors. Um, who all said no, even though he had uh, been unanimously approved for release by parole, which is an almost impossible hurdle to, uh, to traverse. Um, all these governors uh, with political aspirations were worried about the, the, the Willie Horton aspect of freeing anybody. So that's, that's Arnie King. I visited him. I was going to pick up Arnie and take him to the celebration of Tommy Rosa's release. Now, Tommy is, is a, 
a man who has been inside for 25 years, um, always has maintained his innocence all that time. Recently, his case was taken up by the Innocence Project, and um, they started um, uh, scheduling hearings to, to file their, uh, their motions. And on the first hearing, before the Innocence Project lawyer even spoke a word, um, the prosecuting attorney announced that Tommy was released. So his family is rejoicing. We were going to, we had printed up all these welcome Tommy signs and we were going to Everett uh, to his, his wife's house and uh, to, to have a little, a little welcome parade. But then there was this, on Friday, this big rainstorm. So we, we put it off for another day. I still went down to visit Arnie, didn't take him to, to, the, to the celebration. But that's, that's community church's joy for today. Two captives released. And it's a beautiful thing. Arnie is going to uh, speak on November 15th. He will, he will be our presenter that day. Um, and right before welcoming Roy back for, uh, for some more songs, woo, I want to tell you about a couple other things coming up. Um, on the, on the theme of prisons, next Sunday we have uh, Elizabeth Matos, uh, Director of, uh, of Prison Legal Services, uh, talking about issues for prison reform in Massachusetts and legislative initiatives. The music that day is by um, uh, a guy named Dean Stevens. Um, November 1st we have Jill Stein. The music is Magpie. We just look forward to seeing them again. Um, they haven't traveled in quite a while. After that, uh, the, the Sunday after election is our Mark Solomon, um, retired professor of government from Simmons College, who has presented here more times than anybody else. Um, and Mark Solomon will be speaking on a trans transforming moment, what next? And the music that day is Alastair Mook, our new friend, who, um, uh, who we love, love having, wonderful uh, Grammy-nominated uh, American folk and family music performer. Sunday after that, I told you about Arnie King, the performer is Reggie Harris that day, and the, the November 22nd, Norman Stockwell is the, is the editor of the Progressive Magazine. The music that day is David Rovix. Um, I keep on just... A, it's just a, an amazing fall lineup. I, I won't continue because I just really want to get back to the wonderful Roy Zimmerman. We're so glad to have you with us, Roy. Take it away. So glad to be here too, and um, <clears throat> uh, I'm glad that you you're there. I'm glad the community church is, is there then uh, as well. Um, it's, it's kind of a singular. Uh, vision, even in in, uh, in Unitarian circles, I would say, you know, right? You know, having traveled in Unitarian circles, and I do mean circles <laughs> around the yeah. around the entire country um, <clears throat> for for many years there too, visiting all kinds of uh, UU congregations, um, and uh, it, it's a, it's an amazing time in America. Obviously, an amazing time in America, and a time when people are around the world are looking to us. Uh, as they always have as a beacon, you know, George Bush was fond of saying that they hate us for our freedoms, um, which, you know, which is a head scratcher for all of us always. Yeah. Um, because they really, they love us for our freedoms. This is something that uh, the success of these songs you were mentioning that, that have had a success online, the Vote Him Away songs has taught Melanie and I, we get, we're getting, uh, we're getting uh, emails from all over the world people rooting for us, rooting for America, rooting for the idea that is America mm -hmm. and for the religious freedom, particularly that uh, America represents. So with that in mind, here's a little song about, about the history of America's religious freedom. <laughs> When the pilgrims landed on these rocks, they thanked the Lord and they rang out their socks. They were escaping those religious tyrannies. So they said, geez, let us worship as we please. They knew the strictures of their scriptures would never fail them. 
So they started lighting fires on the pyres in Salem. Freedom to oppress in the name of righteousness. Religious freedom to scratch where it itches. Religious freedom to burn our own witches. Y'all know the story of First Thanksgiving? Historical origins of Martha Stewart living. They feasted with the Wampanoag on that shore, then wiped out the Pequot in the Pequot War. They knew God sent them to this Eden among the heathen to say, convert to our dear Lord, or you won't be breathing. Freedom to oppress in the name of righteousness. Religious freedom to scratch where it is. Religious freedom to burn our own witches. Then all the colonies said, what the hell? We don't need a king, let's ring the liberty bell. All men are equal, no one's lesser or greater. We're involved with certain rights by our creator. And that was sweet, but what made liberty even sweeter was they could still own slaves according to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Second Kings, and First Peter. So we the people formed a nation and the Bill of Rights ensures free to practice my religion and you're free to practice mine. Ain't that divine? Slavery opened up a national wound. Much blood was spilled before the Union reunion. They saved the nation in that civil war. Others brought four score and seven years before. And some were certain they could hear the Almighty saying, don't mix the races, segregate and start KKK. Freedom, freedom to oppress in the name of, in the name of righteousness. Freedom to persecute in a biblical pursuit. Religious freedom to burn. But separate is not equal, the Supreme Court found. And they struck all the segregation laws down. They found that marriage is a basic civil right. The law can't break into your bedroom late at night. Still some say we will not heed unelected judges. We know we're righteous and our bigotry never budges. Freedom to oppress in the name of righteousness. Religious freedom to scratch where it is. Religious freedom to burn our own witches. Yeah, religious freedom to scratch where it is. Religious freedom to burn, 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 burn our own witches. <clears throat> Virtual applause. I like that. That's the, I'm getting used to that. <clears throat> One question I get asked um, pretty consistently is like, where are all the protest songs? Do you get asked that, Dean? Where are the protests on here, right? You know, and uh, I got to say that, that you're not listening. <laughs> if you're asking that question, you're not listening because uh, the world is full of protest songs, songs of uh, hope and uh, songs of community and, uh, and anthems, anthems of the movement, you know. Uh, but one thing about anthems is that they they have they have um, they're very stirring and they bring us all together. 
but sometimes there are questions that underlie the anthems. And um, that's what this song is about. And in the folk history traditions, I'm gonna ask you to sing along on this one. How many Mozarts are born among the poor, taken by hunger or by disease or war? Where is the music that we might have heard if fortune was to say they should stay? How many live and die and never know their worth, toiling in darkness by an accident of birth? Can we truly hope for justice on this earth someday? We shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. in hunger become prisoners of need. Some born in privilege become prisoners of greed. When will the people, and I mean all of us, be freed to find a way to say we shall live in peace. We shall live in Peace. We shall live in peace someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I believe we shall work on some. And as we teeter on the brink of war again, build our monuments to vain, ambitious men who talk about the road to peace. I wonder when on earth will they lead that way? And as power is passed to the most fortunate of sons who spend their genius making money, making God. Will there be peace and justice for the humblest ones someday? Love deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. We'll walk hand in hand someday. We shall live in peace some way. Thanks for having me, Dean. Roy, thank you. Thank you so very much. It's Absolutely, thank you. Wonderful pleasure and honor to have you. Um, I want to share one, one little piece of news about Community Church before I introduce Stephen. Um, we are in midst of pa pandemic and um, uh, budget in the toilet kind of a moment, taking on a very ambitious project, which is installation of um, heat pumps, uh, electric heat pumps in, in this entire building. Uh, it, it, the, the, the catalyst was that we found out that the boiler was on its last legs. It's still running. You might be able to hear it uh, clicking over, over in the corner. Um, each time I come in, I just check to make sure it's still running. 
but uh, w we have signed this incredible deal with the utility that's going to pay for two-thirds of the cost of installation of air-sourced heat pumps in this building, uh, which will be an incredible efficiency improvement as well as environmentally just uh, an amazing step by everybody's opinion to change to electric uh, heat pumps in this building. It's a $100,000 project, and we only have to pay 30000 of it. The utility will pay the rest of it through some kind of program. I don't know if it's a, a carrot or a stick, but it, they're involved with, and it's, it's a, a, a wonderful thing. Um, and th that's sort of what's taken up uh, all summer, the, the energy of, of, of the board and my energy just uh, working on on this project, and it's it's coming to fruition quite soon. I'm very happy and proud about that. Even though it'll be heating and cooling a, an, an empty room for the foreseeable future, and empty office buildings above us. So I just wanted to share that with you before introducing Stephen Kinzer. Stephen's first um, presentations at Community Church were in the 80s when he was uh, the New York Times correspondent in, in Nicaragua. Um, and um, between then and now, there was uh, a brief hiatus of about 20 years, but we have welcomed Stephen back um, three or four times now. And it's always a, a pleasure and, and a joy to, to hear Stephen, uh, especially when he's introducing some new book, maybe about uh, the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, the, the times of, um, uh, of Mark Twain and Teddy Roosevelt, or when it's about the Dulles brothers. But the one that I keep going back to is this, a book that really influenced me a lot because it was my, and I think the country's education about what happened in Guatemala in 1953, the U.S. backed coup, not backed, the U.S. engineered coup that overthrew Jacobo Arbenz, the democratically elected uh, president of Guatemala, and um, changed the history of that country uh, all the way up to this very day, and uh, pretty much caused a genocide there during the, during the 80s. Um, and um, Stephen's study that's called Bitter Fruit was just a, a, an enormously uh, influential book in, in my um, understanding of the U.S.'s influence in Central America uh, during all the way back to the 50s, but especially during the 80s when those, those horrible wars happened and it, it hit home because that's where I was uh, born and raised. Um, so thank you, Stephen, for all those books. And um, I want to tell you that I get up in the morning around 6 and listen to Krista Tippett. And then at 7, I listen to Living on Earth uh, and get, um, get my environmental, spiritual education. And then I go out and buy uh, uh, Boston Globe and the New York Times. I take the Times up to my wife, and uh, she gets her coffee and her Times in bed. And, and then I go back downstairs. The first thing I look for is if there's a, an article in the op-ed from Stephen Kinzer on that Sunday. Today there wasn't any, uh, but uh, look for that. I, I always appreciate Stephen's opinions. Stephen, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, well, thanks for that generous introduction, uh, Dean. It's great to be here on this stage, even if it's only virtually, and great to be uh, on the same program with Roy and hear those very moving songs. And great to be in this institution. Uh, this is a, an institution that's played a big role in Boston. And I even remember when my former BU professor, Howard Zinn, would drop by for a presentation here from time to time. So uh, uh, it's an honor to be on, on the list of everybody that's uh, addressed the community church. Uh, I have to tell you that um, I'm in a, a little bit of a disoriented mood at, at this moment. Um, I'm suffering from a mild case of post-traumatic stress. And the reason is that I have just returned from casting my vote. 
I just voted this morning, like about an hour and a half ago. Um, I have a lifelong principle of never voting for anyone I don't like. I do not vote for the lesser of two evils. So that gives me a great way to show my principles in this election. And I was preparing for weeks to write in the name of a certain person on the presidential ballot so that I could maintain my moral purity. Um, also living in a state where thanks to the electoral college my vote doesn't really count. I felt like I was justified in doing this. If we had a normal election system where the candidate with the most votes won, I might feel differently. Um, but I, I felt uh, pretty good about my choice. But in the last few days, uh, as voting day approached, I was uh, caught with conflicting emotions. I sent an email a couple of days ago to one of my favorite peace activists. I won't mention her name. It might be embarrassing to her. Uh, she's, if anything, even more anti-imperialist than I am. And I asked her, uh, what do you think I should do? Do, do I have to go out and vote for someone I really don't like? She was nice enough not to send me a note saying yes or no, but she did send along an article for me to look at. And if you read the article and got to the bottom, you would see that essentially it says, yeah, you, you should go out and vote for Biden. Um, this morning, I got an email from my sister who lives in Mexico and she, she wrote, think of the planet. And then uh, I took off my shelf uh, a book about the rise called William Shirer's book, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, which I had first read, I think, when I was in high school. I was the New York Times correspondent in Germany for a number of years. And in that uh, capacity, I had to, of course, educate myself about German history. And one thing you learn when you do read about the rise of Nazism is that uh, actually, as it dawned on me when I was first moving to Germany and, and immersing myself in that history, part of the responsibility for the rise of Hitler was people like me, I had to admit, people who wanted to uh, pre preserve their moral purity and uh, not vote for someone they didn't like. Uh, so uh, they wouldn't want to unite behind some anti-Hitler candidate. My wife is German and uh, I've had more than one occasion over these last four years when we've been with people who are laughing about something Trump is doing and she mutters something like, yeah, go ahead and laugh. Let me tell you, my grandparents in Germany, they laughed too. Go ahead and laugh. Yeah, very funny. Yeah, it wasn't so funny as the way it worked out in Germany. So all of these influences converged on me and um, I went in and, and bit the bullet and uh, broke with my moral purity, thought of the planet and uh, for some, did something I really don't like to do, which is vote for the lesser of two evils. And I did that. And I'm still a little bit disoriented. I don't feel as bad as I thought I would. I probably feel ba bad um, after the next war starts, um, but at least there's a chance to rebuild something on the ashes of uh, what's been destroyed over these last four years. So uh, count me as a very reluctant realist today. Um, so if I'm hyperventilating a little, that, that's the explanation. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what we might expect if uh, we do have a change of presidencies and if the civil war doesn't break out uh, sometime around mid-November. Uh, I look at Biden uh, and his foreign policy views uh, partly as from the perspective of history, from Biden's background, partly from what he says nowadays and, and partly from the larger context in which uh, he's gonna be working. Um, Biden, of course, uh, was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee for many years. He considers himself something of an expert on world affairs. I have a feeling that whoever becomes Secretary of State, Biden will actually be making the main foreign policy decisions. Um, when Biden was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, he not only voted for and supported the Iraq war, but he engineered uh, committee hearings to be sure that no voices against the Iraq war were able to be heard. This was a great contrast to something that a few of us are old enough to remember, which was the hearings that um, another chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, William Fulbright, held uh, during the 1960s, at, wh at which uh, 
critics of the Vietnam War were given a platform to speak to the nation. And I believe those hearings really did open up people's eyes to what was happening in Vietnam and, and had a great contribution uh, to the rise of protest against that war. Biden refused to do that. I distinctly remember um, a full page ad taken out in the New York Times by a group of international relations scholars warning about the disasters that the Iraq war would bring. Biden refused to invite even one of those people to testify at, the, at those hearings. Uh, so Biden comes very much out of the centrist, democratic, republican approach to uh, foreign policy. He's a great believer in American exceptionalism. Uh, we today have American troops present in 170 countries around the world. I think Biden probably thinks that's fine. Uh, so let me just give a little, uh, make a few comments on particular areas of the world and, and how Biden might approach them. Um, it's a pretty mixed bag and not so encouraging. Uh, first of all, uh, we're looking at dealing with the other two large powers in the world, Russia and China. Anti-Russia sentiment is so deeply ingrained in the American psyche, going all the way back to uh, the time when Woodrow Wilson sent 18,000 American soldiers to fight the Bolsheviks in 1918. Uh, since then, with the brief exception of World War II, we've been anti-Russia as a kind of a default mechanism. Um, and now that emotion has become dizzying. The, the Russia gate uh, rabbit hole uh, is very deep, and Biden's very deep into it. I think Russia gate, in a way, is something like it's QAnon for people with college degrees. And, and Biden has very much uh, embraced that distraction. Everybody loves being anti Russia in Washington. Uh, the Republicans love it because the more we talk about Russia, the less we're talking about police brutality and the pandemic and many other issues. The Democrats love the Russia Gate story because it allows them to believe that Hillary Clinton lost the election because of Russia, not because of Hillary Clinton. Um, and uh, there's a sort of competition to be more anti Russia in Washington. Um, if you seek any improvement in US-Russia relations, you're automatically branded as a Putin puppet reading uh, Kremlin talking points. So it's very difficult to break out of this. Biden has identified Russia as a near peer power, which is odd considering that Russia spends less than one tenth what the United States spends on uh, national defense. So. Uh, the prospects for a new approach to Russia, I think, are quite uh, limited. The same thing is true with China. Uh, there's also a frenzy in Washington among politicians to be more anti-China than everybody else. We're denying the reality of China's importance in the world. I think it's very difficult for many people in Washington to accept the possibility that the United States is not going to dominate the world forever. You know, the countries that have lasted the longest in world history, like China or Iran, are countries that have grasped one central truth, which is you can't expect to be on top all the time. China was hugely powerful. So was Iran. The first empire in the world was the Persian Empire. Then they went down, then they went up, then they went way down, then they went way up again, then they're down. You have to understand how to ride the currents of history if you wanna survive over long periods of time. The United States hasn't done that. It's never occurred to the American security establishment that we could live in a world in which the United States wasn't totally dominant. And I think uh, this is something that Biden probably shares. Um, he's caught in this mindset of dividing the world between friends and enemies. Um, letting some of our so-called partners in the world be the tail that wags the U.S. foreign policy dog. Uh, it, it's all depending on who do we like, who do we not like. This is not the way to work diplomacy. It, it's great for personal relations. When I want to uh, hang out with some other people, I like to hang out with people that I like. I don't want to be with people I don't like. But diplomacy is not like that. Diplomacy is not about affection. It should be about interest and what you can promote in the world. Uh, 
in diplomacy, you always want to offer what uh, international relations scholars call off ramps. So if we're heading toward a crisis, there should be various off ramps, various ways to avoid the crisis. Um, we're so fanatic about imposing sanctions and we never provide ways out of those sanctions. So I think Biden in many ways is very caught up in the traditional approach to the world. Um, looking at the Middle East, I think we see a very similar approach, uh, that, an approach that comes out of this mindset. Um, Biden, of course, was vice president when President Obama negotiated the nuclear deal with Iran. I think he would be open to some kind of a, a new approach to Iran. But uh, still, I'm just reading a, a quote from Biden here. There is a smart way to be tough on Iran. Th this is the Biden approach. So let's beat on Iran, but let's not beat on Iran the dumb way. We'll beat on them the smart way. And I think that would be uh, maybe his approach to other so-called rivals to the United States. Here's another quote from Biden about uh, Iran that really left me shaking my head. I am ready to walk the path of diplomacy if Iran takes steps to show that it is ready too. I will offer Tehran a credible path back to diplomacy. If Iran returns to strict compliance with the nuclear deal, the United States would rejoin the agreement as a starting point for follow-up negotiations. This seems to me completely backwards. It's essentially saying that it was Iran that broke the agreement. Iran walked out of the room. If they ever will come to their senses and come back and agree to work diplomatically, then we'd be willing. But that's not what happened. It was the United States that walked out of the room. So it's for the US to return to the agreement and then uh, see if Iran will uh, trust us once again, which seems like a little bit of a stretch. Um, now, uh, there are there are a few other spots in the Middle East where you can see some changes in the Biden policy. In some cases, he's very much in the paradigm. Israel is a great example of this. Israel has uh, Biden has explicitly said that he would never condition aid to Israel according to what Israel does. So th this seems like a violation of a basic diplomatic principle. You don't want to aid countries that do things that you think are bad. You want to aid countries that you want to help because they're doing good things. So Biden has explicitly said that aid to Israel should never be tied to Israeli behavior. Um, he's called the idea that we should condition our aid to Israel outrageous. And uh, I also copied down this quote from Kamala Harris in a, a phone conversation with Jewish donors. We will continue to assure that Israel has the unbreakable support of the United States. Joe has made it clear he will not tie security assistance to political decisions Israel makes, and I couldn't agree more. Um, now, is there any ray of uh, light in the far Middle East policy for Biden? Yeah, I think there is. Um, Biden has never seemed fully on board with the project of overthrowing the Assad government in Syria. Um, at one point, he got quite irritated at Turkey for uh, opening up the so-called jihadi highway and sending thousands of militants into, uh, into Syria to join the NATO Al-Qaeda coalition that we've been supporting uh, to try to overthrow Assad. Um, here's, here's what he said, he didn't mention Turkey, but uh, he talked about partners in the Middle East. He said they were so determined to take down Assad and essentially have a proxy Sunni Shia war, what did they do? They poured hundreds of millions of dollars and tens of tons of weapons to anyone who would fight Assad, except that the people who were being supplied were al-Nusra and al-Qaeda and the extremist elements of jihadis who were coming from other parts of the world. So that was a pretty uh, uh, clear uh, critique. He, a few days later, he had to apologize to Turkey, but that does show you a little bit of where he's coming from. I don't think he's at the point where he'd be willing to pull troops out of Syria. But as I said, he doesn't seem so fully on board with the policy of uh, the present uh, administration. Um, also, I think you can notice a difference between the candidates in their approach towards that horrific war going on in Yemen. Um, he has 
made clear that he does not approve of uh, our support for Saudi Arabia. Uh, he's been very critical of Saudi Arabia. I was recently on a uh, webinar with Prince Bandar al Sultan, one of the leaders of the of traditional leaders of the Saudi royal family, and he uh, was not happy with Biden. He said Biden had said some things about Saudi Arabia that were impolite. So uh, I, I cheer that. Um, Biden has also pledged that on the first day of his presidency, he would repeal the Muslim ban uh, for immigration into the United States. Um, so there may be an, an opening there. I also think that uh, Biden is aware now, or he's been made aware of the urgency of the climate issue as the overwhelming challenge we face in the world. I would hope that this would help shape, among other things, his approach to China. My own view is that we should put aside our other differences with China and realize that we need to cooperate with China on the climate issue. And we can't be distracted by other things. It's, it's too important. Um, if you uh, believe that uh, it's OK to vote for someone you don't fully agree with, as I did this morning, maybe you could also agree that it makes sense to build a partnership with a country that's doing some things you don't like in order to achieve a, a cosmically important uh, goal. Uh, so given all of that, um, what is the prospect that a Biden presidency could provide some serious change in America's approach to the world? Uh, I, I think there is a prospect, but a, a lot of it depends on us. So here's what I think is the most positive thing you can say about Biden and about Senator Harris. And that is that neither one of them has a strong ideology. Essentially, they have no core beliefs. They, they have no deep principles. They're changing with the times. Uh, Kamala Harris was a lock em up prosecutor in California. She threw a thousand people in jail for smoking pot. She wanted to lock up everyone. She was in favor of mandatory minimum sentences. Uh, she wants to throw the book at every lawbreaker. Now she's all for the opposite. She's for community policing and alternatives to incarceration. Why? Did she change a deeply held belief? No. I don't think she ever had any deeply held beliefs, nor does she have any now. Why did she change? It's because when she was a harsh, uh, police-oriented prosecutor, that's what voters seem to want. And that's why she did it. Now, voters have shifted. Voters don't want that anymore. Even conservatives, in many cases, um, have realized the folly of the super-incarceration policy we've been following. So she shifted with the time. She shifted with the electorate because she sensed that there was a, a change out there and she wanted to be part of it. I think Biden is actually quite similar. Um, he also is vulnerable to being moved as the base of the Democratic Party and the population of the United States moves. Um, I, I was amazed to read an article in Foreign Affairs magazine that was just published about two weeks ago um, saying that it was time for America to reconsider the huge amounts of money we spend on the military. Maybe we should even reconsider support for the F-35 fighter plane, which only costs $1.5 trillion. And what shocked me about this article was who wrote it? It was written by Hillary Clinton, famously characterized quite accurately as queen of warmongers. I had to look at the byline again and ask myself, is there some other Hillary Clinton besides the one I know? These were kinds of things you would never expect coming out of her mouth. Why is she saying that now? I think it's because 20 years of war have made it clear that this policy is not working. It's not good for us. It's not good for anyone else in the world. And if even Hillary Clinton can begin to think like that, perhaps there is hope for a democratic administration. Uh, recently, I found a very interesting, I, I received an interesting report from a group that I follow called the Eurasia Group. The Eurasia Group is a private organization. They are risk consultants and they work for multinational corporations. Their job is to advise corporations on 
how risky it is to go into a certain country. What are the conditions in Kazakhstan? I want to build a factory there. Is it a good idea? So the Eurasia Group will go there and uh, give you a report, which is not tainted by politics, because they're strictly interested in the facts on the ground. So recently, the Eurasia Group was asked by some of its clients to do a survey about a country they don't usually survey, and that is the United States. And so they carried out a series of polls in the United States to find out what people in America think, which is something they do in many other countries. So let me just read you a couple of the findings from this Eurasia Group um, poll. First of all, should we rejoin the Iran nuclear agreement? Two thirds of Americans say yes. Should we rejoin the World Health Organization and sign on to the and the Paris Climate Accords? 70% of Americans say yes. Uh, how about this? They give them a choice between three options. Number one, maintain a strong national defense. Number two, promote democracy around the world. Or number three, keep a focus on domestic needs. The plurality of both parties votes for number three. Um, a majority of both Trump and Biden supporters say that we should negotiate with adversaries even if they are human rights violators. Should we cut the defense budget? It's two to one in the American population, yes. Um, and the key finding, I want to read you a couple of sentences from the conclusion of this report. Americans want more engagement with the world, but on less militarized terms. Support for restraint is broad-based and bipartisan, opposed to the views of the establishment within both political parties. It is unlikely that a second term for President Trump or a first term for Joe Biden will fully represent the American people's desire for a more restrained foreign policy. But as candidates heed public opinion to preserve democracy at home and promote it abroad, public desire for fewer interventions and expansive commitments should become more prevalent in Washington. Attitudes are changing as Americans choose between candidates who reflect few of the public's changing foreign policy preferences. So where does that leave us? It's going to leave us with a, if Biden emerges as our next president, uh, with uh, a president and vice president who do not have unchangeable beliefs. This is not like electing Dick Cheney or electing Bernie Sanders. Those are ideologues. They have strong beliefs and they're not gonna change. Harris and Biden are not like that. They're vulnerable. They, are, they have their finger on the pulse of the Democratic Party base and the American public, and that's us. So uh, if there's an optimistic way to look at this election, it is that uh, if we have a Biden-Harris administration, we have a chance to affect them they are going to be swayed by what they see as the electorate and the base of our party. So if they are taking office on January 20th, the ball is in our court. We then have the chance and the obligation to make clear what Americans really want. And at least on some issues, including the climate issue, which is the decisive one of our era, I do think that this administration would be willing to be pushed by people like us. So um, in a way, it's just a prediction that we have a, a lot of work ahead of us, but at least there's a prospect that that work can have some success, which did not seem to exist over these last four years. So I guess I don't have to hyperventilate too extremely as a result of the vote I cast uh, this morning, I want to look at it as a vote for hope, a vote at least to preserve the possibility that we can have an effect on uh, the policies that the United States has followed in the world over these last four years. And if you're looking for a gleam of optimism, I think that's it. The problem is that we're going to have to work. It's not going to come to us the way it would have come to us if a person had been elected whose name I really wanted to write in on my ballot today, but didn't. However, 
since that person is not going to be our president, I think we do have a prospect of working with a new administration in ways that can save lives around the world and maybe even at this late date help to save our planet. So on that happy note, I think I'll, uh, I'll end. Thank you all for being here. Again, it's an honor and um, let's all realize that the work doesn't end if we have a victory in November, it only begins. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you so much. So great to hear from you again. Uh, and uh, we will have one last song uh, and then uh, a Q&A conversation with some of the participants on the Zoom. Um, I haven't ha grasped how to access uh, the participants or any comments on the YouTube. Charlie, if you could uh, check that for me. If folks want to uh, write in a question on the chat, we will um, recite that to, to Stephen or else uh, we can if if uh, you are on video, we can unmute you and you can talk to all of us. Uh, and here we have a beautiful, beautiful collection basket. Uh, it's from Uganda. And uh, this is what we do during the last song. Um, we talk about how it's with your help that we make these programs happen. It's with your help that we keep this rickety building uh, from falling down. And it's with your help that we pay our uh, tiny staff. So um, there's a couple ways you can do this. You can send a check to the address that's on your handy newsletter that looks like this that you might have gotten in the mail. If you didn't, please be in touch with me and I'll send you one virtually or, or a paper one through the US Postal Service. Uh, that has our address, 565 Boylston Street, Boston, Massachusetts, 02116. You can also go to our website, and, uh, which is communitychurchofboston.org, and there is a PayPal button, and there is also a credit card option for you to, to help us keep this going. Uh, Roy Zimmerman, thank you for joining us, and... Uh, only one last song. Oh, that's um, that's not enough. Um, uh, but yes, one last song, and then and then we'll have some uh, some Q and A back and forth with Stephen. Thank you for that message, Stephen. Too that that that's that's that is a, a, an amazing thought, and uh, um, um, especially the, the the idea that the work begins. You know, I can't wait to start working. Actually, that's the thing. Uh, November 4th, I can't wait to dive in and start doing doing things again. Was there ever a time more hopeful than back when we were saying, yes, we can? The days of hope and change when we were planning to move forward. Well, I think it's time to hope and change again. Forget the kind of feeling we had then. Hope is not enough. Change depends on just one more word. Hope, hope struggle, and change. Hope, struggle, and change. There's trouble and danger on the road to justice. I'm going to keep on hoping. Going to keep my eyes open, and the change will come. Change will come, but it won't be easy. You know that civil rights didn't call to us the moment Rosa Parks stepped on that bus. So many fought and died for racial justice before and after. And suddenly a ray of hope appears, but only after years and years and years. Only because of blood and sweat and tears, and yes, even laughter. Hope, struggle, and change. Hope, struggle, and change. There's trouble and danger on the road to justice. I'm going to keep on hoping. Gonna keep my eyes open, and the change will come, change will come, but it won't be easy. Elizabeth Cady Stanton never saw 
a woman's right to vote become the law. The women everywhere now know the awesome load she carried. And Stonewall didn't settle any pipe. There's been a lot of stonewalling since that night. The Supreme Court recognized the right of people to be married. Old struggle in change. Old struggle in change. There's trouble and danger on the road. You're just gonna keep on hoping. I'm gonna keep on hoping. Keep my eyes open. Gonna keep my eyes open. Change will come. Change will come. Change will come, but it won't be easy. We gotta hope and cry. Work until we die. We gotta plan and fail. Spend the night in jail. We gotta really get this resist. Raise a fist, we gotta try to revolutionize. We gotta bleed and weep, except guarantee. We gotta set no doubt, get the vote out. We gotta howl, yell, leave a lot of hell. We gotta educate and organize. Keep our eyes on the prize. So asking any president to make fundamental change, that's our mistake. We gotta be a giant, just awakening from its slumber. You know the moral arc of the universe is bending ever better, never worse. It's almost like the human race rehearsing for its big number. Sing me now. Old struggle and change. Old struggle and change. Trouble and danger. Oh, there's trouble and danger on the road to justice. Keep on hoping. Keep on hoping. Keep my eyes open. Gonna keep my eyes open. And the change will come. Change will come, but it won't be easy. Yeah, the change will come. Change will come, but it won't be free. Oh, the change will come, change will come from you and me. <clears throat> Thank you once again for having me, Dean. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Roy. So we must work hard, we must have faith, we must be strong. Change, it will come, but it will take so long. <laughs> but maybe it's here, maybe it's just starting. Thank you, everybody. And Stephen, uh, let's look for some, some questions um, uh, or comments or observations. Let's start with just uh, if there's Hello? someone who wants to, I see Lee Fitch, Lee Fitch. Let me find Lee, where are you? I'll... I'm right up here. Okay, go ahead, Lee. Uh, Mr. Kinzer, I, I really appreciate everything you said. I have a question. Do you feel, I mean, this is not really answerable, but my sense of, 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 of the vice presidential candidate, Kamala, is that she learned and that she grew in, in, in that she just didn't change because of public opinion to get to get a, a high a different job. I kind of think that's unfair a little. Yeah, it's hard. I hate to uh, I hate to judge people's motives. All I like to see is the result. So is I don't even know if you can draw the line. Maybe it was the public pressure forced her to learn and grow. Maybe there are different versions of the same thing. How did she grow? She understood what was happening in the world a little better than she used to, or maybe the oh, world and what changed. she thought of her job. And that her yeah. job itself, she saw what was happening. And and that's what I think is the uh, the real hope for a Biden uh, Harris administration. I I mean, you know as well as I do, I can't guess, but I think there's at least a 50-50 chance that. Biden is not, if he's elected, wouldn't finish his term. So I would, I, I do think it's a positive thing, considering who those people are, that they're open to this kind of thing. Their record shows that they can change. I mean, I just voted for Ed Markey super enthusiastically. Ed Markey is a tiger. I, I supported him so strongly in the primary. On the other hand, I remember when Ed Markey voted for the Iraq war. 
I remember when Ed Markey voted for the Hyde <laughs> Amendment to ban all abortions under all circumstances. That's not the Ed Markey that's on the ballot today. So that's good. I, I don't hold that against him. I think I'm voting for the person that exists today. And, and uh, I think with Biden and Harris, both of them are better people than they used to be. And that suggests that they might mo be moving even further uh, after they're elected. So could it be that it was just their own minds that grew? Or was it popular pressure? I'm not sure, maybe some combination of both, but I think they both lead us to the same place. And it's a place where you can at least have some hope uh, after a period when we were really looking desperately for some. Thank you, Lee. I noticed Mike Heishman had his hand up. Uh, if you will unmute, Mike. Thank you very much. So I'm speaking to you, Steve, and I'm speaking to everybody else here. Thank you for your presentation. I'm sorry you wasted your vote. Uh, uh, you, you know, uh, we all knew that Trump was the enemy. And it's unfortunate that I think that uh, there's so much hope that Biden and Harris are gonna be on our side. Now, they're not gonna be as bad, okay. But I think that's, uh, you know, hope is delusional. Uh, with, based on in terms of history, look at look at the last two presidents, uh, Democratic presidents Clinton and Obama. They were what they said they were, and what happened to the movements after they were elected. One one of the things is the movement knows that Trump is the enemy, and we have these massive marches. Um, the Democratic Party screwed Bernie and it's okay with us. We'll still vote for the Democrats. So I, I, I'm not just speaking to you, I'm speaking to everybody here. It's like, uh, we're a church. We have things that we say that we believe in. And I'm proud that I didn't waste my vote and I voted for uh, 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 the, the Green Party ticket. Uh, we need a march in a different uh, direction. We're in hell now, and Biden-Harris will continue to move us into deeper hell. Thank you. Well, what you just expressed is essentially what I was thinking for the last few months, right up until the last 24 hours. So I, I, I can't argue with you. I, I wouldn't use the phrase so much hope. I don't have so much hope. And I certainly wouldn't use the phrase on our side. I, I'm not expecting ever to see a president who's on our side. We all, we're, we're working within a very narrow uh, spectrum, of course. Um, is it delusional to think that some substantial change can come out of the electoral system that we're producing now? Maybe it is. On the other hand, denial is an essential part of life. If you have to face the horrific realities of life all the time, you might as well just die tomorrow. You need to have something to keep you going. Um, I remember a great line from Shakespeare, uh, the worst is not so long as we can say this is the worst. So I don't expect a breakthrough. Um, and I'm as you can tell, I'm still conflicted. I, I hope I don't wake up sometime and think that I really made a big mistake. Uh, you will. I'm sure I will at some point, uh, but I'd have to weigh some new war that Biden starts against the destruction of the entire planet that might have happened otherwise. So uh, this was a, I cast a very reluctant vote and um, I'm, I cannot argue against what you said. I, I really have both views in my mind. I wish I were somewhere uh, where I could cast a vote more enthusiastically. You might know that today is election day in Bolivia. Oh, I wish I could be voting in Bolivia now. Now there's a candidate I'd really like to support. Um, it's really the reverse. I've had so many people tell me in countries like Nicaragua, I should be allowed to vote in an American election because your leaders have more effect on my life than anybody in my country. Now, I could vote for a candidate I really support, like someone in Bolivia, but I don't have that choice, so I have to uh, go down to another level of moral calculation that I find uh, very uncomfortable, as you can probably tell. Thank you. All right. Um, let's see. 
One more, uh, Barry, uh, go ahead, and then we'll get some from the chat. Go ahead, uh, Dave Lewitt. Yes, thank you. Uh, Steve, uh, that's a, a wonderful, wonderfully encouraging talk. Thank you so much. Um, my, I would like to have your opinion about how we can, about changing the system, particularly to enable uh, uh, some kind of a balance in the input and uh, uh, power of uh, the two parties uh, and uh, the transformation of this two-party system uh, into uh, something wider uh, so that winner take all will be eliminated. Uh, will it, will it, winner take all is killing us because a small majority of the Senate seems to be able to control everything. So uh, how can we, how can we uh, achieve a more balanced system? That, that's a huge, a huge challenge. I guess uh, we need to pull up another generation of uh, John Adams's and uh, James Madison's and they don't seem to be out there. Uh, one thing that I think would be a substantial change uh, in American political life would be if we could somehow change the way political campaigns are financed. I woke up, I think it was the day before yesterday to the news that uh, Sheldon Adelson has just donated $75 million to Trump for his campaign. How can you consider this a democracy when somebody can do that? This is not possible in almost any other democratic country in the world. Uh, the control that the arms industry has over American politics is so tight. It isn't just uh, that they contribute to members of Congress who then vote for those ridiculously expensive arms programs, but they then uh, divide up all their contracts into pieces and put factories in the districts of all the important members of Congress. So those members of Congress will have to vote for new arms programs. Otherwise, they're throwing people out of work in their own district. So I would love to see some change in the political finance system. Uh, one thing that's going on in Massachusetts that I find encouraging, even though it still hasn't gotten major traction, is the protest against Raytheon. You may know that Raytheon, a Massachusetts-based company, is manufacturing all the missiles that are blowing up houses in Yemen every day. And there is a campaign against Raytheon. I think it would be great to concentrate on members of Congress who take money from Raytheon. And this leads me to another little uh, area where I think there's room for activism. So you may, I mentioned earlier uh, the power that the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and the House counterpart have because even though they're only one vote, they decide who to invite to hearings. And that determines what kind of news Americans hear about the world, what kind of things people write about. Right now, there is a serious battle going on to replace the uh, thankfully defeated Elliot Engel, who was chairman of the House Foreign Relations Committee. One of the candidates is Joaquin Castro from, uh, from Texas, who is more inclined towards the progressive foreign policy than anybody who has been running that committee in generations. Um, there are two members of Congress from New England who are on that committee. Uh, one is David Cicilline from uh, Rhode Island and the other is Bill Keating from Massachusetts, one of those candidates who receives money from Raytheon. So I think it would be a great uh, focus of pressure to push those two candidates to commit themselves to voting for Joaquin Castro <laughs> as a way of opening up the debate in Washington about foreign policy. I know that uh, the arms industry and its allies in Washington are working very hard to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, these are small steps, uh, but we need to find some way to break the hold of a handful of arms uh, makers and hedge fund managers on our political system. And to me, uh, one way to do that would be to move toward public financing of electoral campaigns. I know what's going to happen. If Congress could ever get to the point of doing that, which seems very difficult given who elects people to Congress, uh, then you'd probably have the courts 
which have also been packed by people who support those corporations, ruling those uh, uh, laws unconstitutional. So it's a high mountain to climb. Americans have always proven uh, reluctant to move into new political parties in a large way. It's, that's very frustrating. Um, I loved AOC's comments uh, a few months ago where she said, there's no other country in the world where Joe Biden and I would be in the same political party. It's true, but there they are. And there is AOC yeah. working on the climate task force for Biden-Harris. So I agree with you that in a better world, we would have a variety of options and we wouldn't have to choose between two that are so unpalatable. That's one reason I voted today for the ranked voter choice, which is on the Massachusetts ballot today. I think that's a small step forward. And unfortunately, given the restrictions of the American political system, small steps seem like big ones when we can finally accomplish them uh, within the limits that we have. We, we have to take those small steps and then try to turn them into big steps over time. But how can we change uh, ju just one thing here? The committee chair takes all. Committee chair decides everything. How can we get the minority on a committee to be able to provoke, to have some witnesses there? In other words, to, uh, to dilute the power of committee chairs in, the two, in each of the houses. The only way to do that is to change the House leadership, because the reason that Joaquin Castro is, has such a difficult hill to climb is that it's Nancy Pelosi who effectively is telling the members of the committee who to vote for. And she's the one who has all the levers to pull. I'm hoping that we might be in the last uh, Nancy Pelosi term as Speaker of the House. That would be a spectacular change if we could produce um, a Speaker of the House who would be more sympathetic to uh, views like ours. You know, I still remember when Tip O'Neill was Speaker of the House and his kids essentially got him to oppose the Vietnam War. And then because he was Catholic, he had a number of Catholic nuns come to him and he became a critic of the war in El Salvador and the wars in Central America. So a change in Speaker of the House would be enormous. And I would love to see members of Congress being pushed more uh, to uh, try to commit themselves to a, a new kind of speakership. That would lead to a democratization of, of committees. As for minorities having a role on Capitol Hill, I think uh, one of the whole points of the way Congress is organized is to make sure that doesn't happen. And the way you rebel against that is by electing people who uh, have a different perspective. You talked about ranked voting. Look what just happened in the district that uh, Joe Kennedy vacated. There you had about six progressives running and one guy who was a former Republican. He looked at the field and decided there's a room for a more or less Republican type candidate. And he won with something like 23% of the votes. That never would have happened if there had been ranked voting. And that's one reason why I did rouse myself to go to the polls this morning. Okay, um, Stephen, here's, here's one from Jose Aleman, former uh, Consul General uh, of El Salvador for New England. And his question is, what's going to be different in regards to Cuba, Venezuela, Mexico, and Latin America in general? Um, I do think that uh, Latin America is off the radar screen to a certain degree uh, for Biden and Harris. And that's probably good since most of the time we pay attention to Latin America, bad things happen. Um, I think there might be a little bit of difference among uh, those different countries and issues that uh, the, the consul brought up. Uh, I wonder, for example, if Biden might be willing to live with a leftist government in Bolivia uh, if one were to emerge. I really feel that at this point, the United States is gonna do whatever's necessary to make sure that the election comes out the way we want. 
Uh, Biden might not feel so uh, urgently pushed to do that. Uh, the worst piece of news about Biden uh, in Latin America is Venezuela. He is definitely on the I hate uh, I hate Chavez. He also hates Fidel Castro. The reason he wants to overthrow Chavez is because he wants to attack Fidel Castro. That's a way of attacking the Soviet Union. This is the mindset that we're still in. So. Uh, He's always railing about the Chavez dictatorship and uh, we have to liberate the, the poor people suffering there. His, his Venezuela policy is really depressing, very similar to what we've had now. Maybe there'd be some le lessening of sanctions, but again, he's caught up in this verse, friend or enemy. Oh, Venezuela, enemy. This is not the way to look at the world. The one good news I think that you might see in Latin America would have to do with Cuba. And again, I go back to the fact that Biden was vice president when the president of the United States went to Havana. So I think that uh, both on the Iran uh, deal and the opening of relations with Cuba, we might really see with Biden uh, a shift back to a little bit of what, what we had with Obama. And although uh, there's certainly plenty to criticize in Obama's foreign policy record, I think those were two bright spots. Biden was involved in an administration that did both of those. So I think uh, Venezuela, I wouldn't see a great change in American policy. We, we might be a little bit less crazy. Maybe we wouldn't be sending mercenaries to land on the shores of Venezuela in the hope that the nation will rise up and beg the United States to come over and take over their country. We, we might not go that far as we have been going up to now. But better news might happen in Cuba and I think uh, that might be the best piece we can hope for in, in Latin America. One more from the chat, uh, Stephen. Um, if this is from Barry Wanner in Burlington, Vermont. How likely is it that with the pandemic and outrageous defense budget, will a Biden-Harris administration follow mass action for peace motto, more health care, no more warfare? You know, I do think that the pandemic has to focus the idea that our biggest national security threats are not coming from foreign capitals. They're not from foreign leaders. We have other national security threats. When most of our kids are not getting educated and we're 24th in the world in the level of our high school graduates, that's a national security threat. When we have 200,000 dead Americans and millions of infected Americans, that's a national security threat. So the more people focus on that, and it's almost unavoidable to do so, I think the more likely they are to say, well, if we have to pay more attention to housing, education, um, and social projects inside the United States, that must mean that we have to pay less attention to something else. And this is one of my uh, critiques of some of the aspects of the Black Lives Matter and other anti-racism movements and other progressive movements is that they haven't fully made clear or fully grasped the link between their movements and foreign policy. Every time somebody proposes something like Medicare for all or free community college education for all Americans, uh, people on the other side always say, oh, it sounds great, but how are you going to pay for it? Well, there's an answer to how you're going to pay for it. A trillion and a half dollars to build the F-35 fighter plane, that's a lot of schools. And that's a lot of hospitals. That's a lot of vaccinations that can be paid for with that money. So maybe the pandemic has focused our attention on what the real threats to America are. And if it does that, Maybe it will also make us realize that some of the places where we say we see threats coming from are not really our biggest threats. Kevin Devine, uh, I saw your hand up. Uh, if you will unmute yourself, there you, you know, go. I, I just un yeah, I've just yeah. Um, so yeah, what, what, what it was. Uh, well, I'm just thinking that uh, having been a, a labor activist for. A number of years when I was in a union, a trade union, SEIU Local 509, mainly, uh, that a lot of a lot of this, a lot of what we're talking about, I think, has to do with the fact that our unions have pretty much been put on the back burner, or they've been destroyed by uh, 
by other 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 administrations. Uh, mainly, I can go back to to the early fifties. I mean, uh, when they uh, they got rid of the the leftists, the socialists, um, and then the labor activists. Uh, we're talking about now. Uh, you you know, it seems like the unions have been uh, destroyed and. Uh, the the voice of people at the workplace is sort of like non-existent. It's there are still unions, but they're not very effective. Okay, but that's my my point is that that emphasis has caused uh, uh, the the right wing to win to I to to get the advantage uh, and, uh, and basically what's happened is that you've lost. Um, uh, people have lost their jobs because of many trade agreements that have been passed. Uh, and also the Democratic Party, which was originally thought to be the party of the people, sort of a, a populist party. It's, does, it's not. That, has, that changed in the early 90s, I believe, under Clinton. And he became, it became a corporatist party. Uh, it may, in other words, you're more interested in, uh, you know, getting, using money, to get votes, all right? And not the, the idea of door knocking and calling people on the phone to get people to support a particular candidate who supported a particular issue that was beneficial to workers was, that wasn't the focus. And so that's what we're have. We're in that situation. I, I, I'm talking in generalities right now, but I think it's still, uh, still true and, uh, I think we're going to be in this mess now. I don't know what's with this Trump, Biden. I mean, we have one corporatist versus a potential neo-fascist. Uh, it's it's pretty bad. And I believe that if Biden wins, we've got to get on the stick and stay clear, you know, straight on the course and get Kevin? them to form a progressive program. That's it. Okay. For, to help the people. That's all. I think you're absolutely right about labor unions. The, the collapse of the labor movement, which has been forced by the political pressures that, as you say, became very intense under the Clinton administration when Clinton turned to Wall Street as the main funder of the Democratic Party, has been a devastating for the United States. Labor unions have traditionally been the way to bring people into the middle class. That's exactly why people are trying to, the corporatists are trying to destroy them. I think that's one of the reasons why people want to destroy the post office, because how many millions of people have been given good jobs and pensions through unions, through the postal service? This is one area where I do think there's going to be a real difference with Biden. Biden is a hard bar Catholic ethnic from Scranton, Pennsylvania. He saw a lot of union jobs disappear. I do think that Biden at least does not uh, sign on to the what has become the Democratic as well as the Republican policy that unions are bad, that we have to avoid them. They, they, uh, they only create trouble. I think Biden recognizes the value of labor unions. And uh, you will not have an anti-labor secretary of labor as we've had in the last four years. How much difference that's going to make, I don't know. But if you're looking for differences that are clear between what we've had and we might have under Biden, I think labor unions might be one of them. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, I want to uh, just uh, take this chance to 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 just say hi to all these all these wonderful folks that that I haven't seen in a long time, um, uh, and uh, invite you uh, to come into the church. Uh, I feel safe having one-on-one -on -one time here with, with folks. If anybody wants to come by, I know that Ed Imbeer is coming tomorrow to do some work up in the archives. I'm very proud to, to show folks what's going on up on our presently unoccupied fifth floor, which has all of the archives of uh, 100 years of this church spread out all, all over the, the thousand square feet up there. And, and it's great, they've been, relegated to a tiny broom closet for, for decades now, and we have them all, all out, and we're trying to make sense and uh, organize them and, um, 
and make them available uh, and figure out what to do with them, whether to send them off to some repository or to keep them and try to preserve them ourselves here. We have uh, decades and decades of, of recordings uh, in every format possible. Um, would love to share this individually with, with anybody. And um, I really appreciate Ed's uh, initiative in, in, in helping with the great experience in archiving that he has. Uh, I want to say hi to Tilly Ruth. Tilly, can you hear me? I don't see your face in the, in the video, but um, love, uh, love seeing you, I think, for the first time on that screen. Um, and uh, Jim Casteris from up in New Hampshire. Um, uh, Lenny Shames from uh, Brunswick, Maine. Um, uh, Alan Clements from uh, Bangor and North uh, Maine. Jose Aleman, Dorothy Weitzman. Pat, I don't know which Pat that is, but hi, Pat. Uh, anyway, there's a bunch more that I, that I can't mention. Lee Fitch and, and Ken Casanova, Mike Heishman, of course. Um, and just that uh, sweep of everybody who is on the Zoom, and there's probably 20 or 30 more on the YouTube channel. Thank you, Stephen, for being with us. And um, it's, it's just uh, really great to hear from you and get our thoughts on this thing called voting that we're all about to do. I hope we're all about to do. There's some that are quite kind of like uh, not sure, including, um, well, I, I won't mention any names, but kind of like saying we don't want to encourage them. I'm going to vote, and it's my sacred duty, and it's our sacred duty, and I'm going to send it in by mail because uh, I love the post office, including a retired post office worker who's, who's amongst us here today. and. Um, uh, so, I have nothing else to say except to bid you all goodbye. If any of you are not members of this church and would like to sign your name in our membership book, we can make an appointment for you to come in and do that. Um, I haven't figured out the logistics or the protocol of doing that virtually, but we, we do have that, that beautiful old membership book that has a lot of pages left for you to, to fill in your, your name and be, um, be counted among those who, uh, who consider themselves active members of, and contributors and participants in this, in this endeavor called Community Church of Boston. So I wanna end on an observation that uh, our, our beloved president, Charlie Welch, um, uh, who is also our technical advisor on, on this Zoom call, and thank you for getting us through some harrowing moments five minutes before showtime here. Um, um, Charlie writes that on Monday, October 5th, 2020, the Cambridge City Council unanimously approved a policy order on medical and scientific collaboration with Cuba. That includes a call for suspending relevant U.S. economic and travel sanctions against Cuba, highlighted by leadership from longtime Cuba activist and educator Mary Ansara uh, and council member Dennis Carloni. Uh, we should have them come and speak at the church sometime soon, Charlie. The policy order focuses on saving lives, aspects of the collaboration. See this website, www.july26th.org. And, um, and shout out to the Henry Reeve Brigade, all those doctors who have gone to so many different places during this horrible uh, emergency crisis moment on the entire planet they should be winning the Nobel Peace Prize. And I've put in my, my letter on, on their behalf, and you can do that too. Uh, Henry Reeve Brigade, uh, which is the doctors from the, uh, the, the medical school, graduates from the medical school in Cuba. Um, okay, we're all done. Let's uh, unmute everybody so we can clap for Stephen Kinzer and for Roy Zimmerman who has left us. Thank you so much, everybody. And before we uh, um, go, Steve, I need your street address. <laughs> uh, I, know, I know you want my street address to send me a check, but I don't want the check. I want you to add it to your, make it my contribution and use it for the good of the church. Uh, you need it more than I do. Go ahead, don't bother to send me a check. Stephen, thank you so much for uh, for that and uh, uh, you're among a, a bunch of others who have said the same thing 
and that is a very kind contribution to what we do here. Um, and, and we will accept that um, with, with great thanks and gratitude. Meeting at okay. the building is over, folks. Meeting at the building is over. And we'll see you again next Sunday for Prison Legal Services, Liz Matos. We love you all. Take care and be well. Hasta la próxima. Until the next one. <laughs>